Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark, and there's Charles W. Chuck Bryant, and there's Jerry Jerome Rowland, St. Jerome herself, hanging out, and this is Stuff You Should Know. Just the three of us, we can make it if we try. <laughs> I think we should detail what happened right before we re-recorded. It's very uh, illustrative. Illustrative? Oh, I like the way you say it, Frenchie. <laughs> of uh, this topic. I think you should share for sure. Well, we were debating on which episode to record first of our two. Uh, this one is about rock, paper, scissors. And as a joke, I said, why don't we use rock, paper, scissors to decide? <laughs> right. But we don't use video, so we would just be throwing rock, paper, scissors and going on each other's word. And as soon as we did it, none of it felt right to me. <laughs> I shared what I what I shot, and I was truthful. I know, and I <laughs> stopped myself <laughs> because, A, I didn't throw anything because I thought we were kind of kidding. Oh, okay. But it just uh, – and then you said that you thought that people – Jerry said, are you really doing this as an episode? <laughs> and you said a lot of people might think the same thing. Uh, but I want to defend it out of the gate okay. as a part of a two-part series that I came up with of seeming uh, children's games mm -hmm. where there's a lot more there mm -hmm. under the surface. Uh, and I'll go ahead and preview and say the next one will be follow, uh, followed is Tug of War. Wait a minute. There's a third one, isn't there? I thought you requested yet another one. No. <laughs> I, I goofed up, and when I sent Dave the idea, I accidentally sent tic-tac-toe. Right. And he was like, uh, there's not much on this after researching it for half a day. And I went, oh, dude, I oh, meant no. to say rock, paper, scissors. I'm so sorry. Oh, no. Okay. Because Poor there is Dave. a lot to rock, paper, scissors. Yeah. I don't think there's as much with tic-tac-toe. <laughs> no. No. Poor Dave. Okay, good. Got it. So, okay. So, tug of war and rock, paper, scissors. That's a winning combo, if you ask me. And apologies to Dave Ruse. Uh for for the mid game shift, yeah, and many many thanks to Mighty Dave Roos for helping us out with these too. <laughs> MDR, mm -hmm. it's better than the rooster. Which remember how we were like, oh yes, of course the rooster, and we talked to him yeah. about. It. He's like, uh, yeah, they, they've been calling me that since like first grade, guys. It's not new, so we we're, we're moved on. Now we're on to Mighty Dave Roos. That's like someone saying Upchuck and then laughing as if it's original to me. That is genius. <laughs> <laughs> I've never called you that. No, of course not. Okay. So today, we're not talking about tug of war, Chuck. We're talking about rock, paper, scissors. And I feel like we should at least kind of explain, because unless you've been living under a rock or a <laughs> sheet of paper or a giant pair of scissors, everybody knows what rock, paper, scissors is, right? Yeah. Should we do that and then tell Dave's little story? Because I think it's pretty fun. Sure. Yeah. Uh, well, it's a game, a yeah. children's game, namely, although I would argue that if more adults decided some things this way, right. it would be a better life for everyone. Agreed. Because I think kids don't bring emotion into decision-making like adults do, mm -hmm. or and they don't write fight like adults do. Mm -hmm. So I think it can be a very egalitarian way to settle an, something fairly easy. Totally. And quickly. Very quickly. Uh, but yeah, it's a game where you, uh, some people count one, two, three. Some people say rock, paper, scissors. And on that third beat, you each throw out a hand indicating a fist for a rock, mm -hmm. a flat hand, mm -hmm. palm down for a paper, or mimic a pair of scissors with your index and birdie Middle. finger. <laughs> what finger? I always call it the birdie finger. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> These are the Bernie finger. Oh, sure. Well, that too. The Bernie Sanders finger. <laughs> yeah. Because he's, he's so well known. <laughs> Whenever he gets heckled on stage, he just throws a couple of birds <laughs> high up in the air and says, read them and weep. <laughs> That's pretty good, Bernie. Thank you. That was actually my Phil Hartman doing Sinatra. No. Oh. I thought it was Larry David doing Bernie. No, no, but it works both uh, ways. But that's the game, and you and you generally do best of three, but that has to be agreed upon beforehand. Okay, so that is, and, and like this game is so basic and simple, but it's also so widely played around the world that there's variations to almost everything you just said. Like yeah. I've seen plenty of people who do it on the fourth count, rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Um, 
it, they're like if you were playing on a pro rock paper scissors um, tournament, you would not put your hand down, palm down. You'd have it palm out to the left or the right, depending on what hand you were playing with. There's like all sorts of little variations, but ultimately the point of it is is that for each one of those possible choices, those three choices you could possibly make, it has one it can beat and one it can lose to which makes it incredibly thrilling. With just three little hand combinations, you can either win, lose, and it happens in the blink of an eye. It's a really great game. I, I'm with you totally. It is, and it's, um, I, I think generally to dis, uh, to settle a dispute, not always, it doesn't. It never struck me as the kind of game you would just sit around and play, you know? Oh, yeah, no, it's, yeah, I know, you're right. Maybe if you were practicing, if you were a weird kid practicing your rock, <laughs> sure. paper, scissors, but yeah, no, nobody's just sitting around playing that like they're playing cards or something. Right, and it's between two people because if you have more than two people, you'll probably go with an eeny, meeny, money mo or an engine, engine number nine. I don't think I've ever seen three people playing rock, paper, scissors before at once. I don't think you can. Mm. That's the whole point. I, I, I don't know. We should try it. I wonder if the universe would crumble around us. Yeah, but who would, like, you have to be matched up against a person. Otherwise, I mean, I guess if two people did paper and one person did rock, you would eliminate that person. Mm -hmm. I think, I don't know, maybe you're onto something. I might be. I feel like I've just kind of upped the evolution of the human species. (laughs) I think so, too. (laughs) So you mentioned a story Dave came up with, and you're talking about settling disputes you can also use it to make decisions, too, especially if your name is Takashi Hashiyama, who was a Japanese electronic firm uh, C-suite executive, I think maybe the CEO of one of those companies. And um, he used to like to use rock, paper, scissors to um, to basically make important decisions when everything else was essentially equal. And he ran into the same thing in, in 2005, didn't he? Yeah, and I guess it worked out for him if he was a C-level executive, Mm -hmm. if that's a measure of success to you. Sure. Uh, But he was an art collector, and he had about a $20 million art collection of some very noteworthy artists and was going to auction it off and said, should I choose Christie's or Sotheby's? They're both great, and I don't know what to do, so I'm going to make them play each other in rock, paper, scissors for the account. Yeah. Because that's what Japanese electronics executives with $20 million art collections do. Yeah. They, they make other people play rock, paper, scissors for their own amusement. So apparently Christie's recruited a pair of 11-year-old twins, uh, Alice and Flora, who were the twin daughters of the International Director of Impressionist and Modern Art for Christie's. And the reason that they turned to these two 11-year-old twins is apparently they were rock, paper, scissors dynamos. They played all the time, and they also, like, understood the psychology behind it, too. And it actually paid off in aces for for Christie's turning to these two. Yeah, because in the interview, I think the New York Times interviewed the girls, and Alice said, everyone knows you always start with scissors because rock is way too obvious, (laughs) and scissors beats paper. Uh, And I kind of laughed at that at first, like that's such a thing a kid would say, but rock, there may be something, too— an adult being an aggressive move with the rock. Mm-hmm. There may be something to that. Mm-hmm. So that's actually what they did. They they started with scissors on the day of the whole um, the whole rock paper scissors playoff to see who would host this auction of this twenty million dollar art collection. Um, Christie's went with scissors, and just like the twins predicted, um, Sotheby's went with paper because apparently they thought rock would be too obvious, and they thought that rock that Christie's would go with rock, so they went with paper, but instead Christie's went with scissors. And that actually demonstrates what you were saying earlier, that there's a lot more to rock, paper, scissors than meets the eye. Because, like, it's these twins' assertion that you would want to go with scissors every time first because the psychology of your opponent can be kind of relied upon. Other people say you would never want to go with scissors and so on and so forth. And there's actually, like, game theorists that study this. Um, there's a whole lot to this this topic. So I guess what I'm saying is is good idea picking this one because I don't know if I ever would have. <laughs> well, what I did think was interesting is, and what would have been a funnier ending to the story is that he didn't have them actually play the game with their hands. He had them each write down uh, the Japanese 
word for rock, paper, or scissors on a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. And I thought it just would have been funny if they didn't know that little hitch. And like, you know, Christie's had someone who spoke Japanese, Sotheby's didn't. Right. So they were like, ah, you win by default. Yeah, we forfeit. (laughs) We don't know. Uh, But yeah, it's, um, I think there's something about the simplicity of it that just, and the future tug of war episode that just grabs me. Mm -hmm. Because when you start talking game theory, and we'll get to that, it's, uh, I've I've wanted to do an episode on game theory forever, but it's just, it breaks my brain a little bit when you really get into it. Yeah, I think it's made up. So I think this might be a good way to just satisfy that. Good, good, good thinking. These two topics grab you and say, let's play. (laughs) Uh, As far as where this came from, you know, of course, anything like this, people are going to say came from ancient Egypt because you can look at almost any mural or set of hieroglyphics and say, (laughs) this is what I think they were doing here. It's very vague. Hey, wait, I think that one's giving me the bird. (laughs) <laughs> and I think that's kind of what happened with the Beni Hassan uh, burial murals, right? Uh, I don't know. I think that the scholars typically agree that they're they're doing something like a, what's called a finger flashing game. That there's there's something like that. It's not rock paper scissors. I don't I don't believe scissors were invented yet. Right. Um, but that doesn't mean, as we'll see, there's a lot of other games that aren't rock, paper, scissors. They don't have to be rock, paper, or scissors. You can kind of substitute just about anything for your hand gesture. And it's possible they were playing that. I think what's what keeps it from being definitive is that there's nothing in like that that we've figured out from from uh, transcribing hieroglyphics using the Rosetta Stone that said, "Hey, you guys of the future really missed out playing this uh, finger mm-hmm. flashing game that we didn't bother to really." Uh, put down, but it's definitely the the predecessor of of rock paper scissors. There's nothing like that, so it's just kind of like it's possible it goes back that far. Yeah, and I couldn't, you know, I looked like Dave did to try and find a picture of that specifically, mm-hmm. and there were a lot of pictures of this mural or set of murals, but I saw a lot of wrestling. Yeah, well, yeah, uh, there's a lot of that. A lot of wrestling going on, a lot of gamey gaming type stuff, mm-hmm. but I could not find the specific finger flashing game. Um, there's also, did you ever do the, the even odd thing? I never really understood that one. What is that one? When you throw, you like go one, two, three, and you throw one, two, or three fingers. For what? To decide something. It's a finger flashing game. Oh, okay. So it's basically, like what we're talking about. it's basically the, the Dullard's version of rock, paper, scissors. Well, I don't know. It may be regional. Like they did it on Seinfeld, I remember. Uh-huh. Uh, and it's like evens or odds. But I never, like, no one I knew ever did that. No, that's that's odd. <laughs> or it may be old-timey, too, because I remember movies in the like set in the 50s and 60s, I feel like they did that some, too. That's very weird because, I mean, by that time, from, from what I can tell, Rock, Paper, Scissors had made its way to the United States from Asia. And, oh, sure. And had been around for a while. So why would you go from Rock, Paper, Scissors to something as boring as, <laughs> you know, one, two, or three fingers? You know? I don't know. And I think the thing with that game is you call even or odd beforehand, and then you put the two hands together, and whichever wins, wins. Does that make sense? I'm probably explaining that poorly. I think that deserves its own episode. Like you would say even, I would say odd. We throw fingers. I throw two. You throw one, Uh and that's odd. So I win. Does that make sense? Oh, if you add them together, it's odd. Yeah, yeah. But then, if you added any odd to any even, wouldn't it always be odd? Well, but if we both did ones, that would be even. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but no, but if I threw four and you threw five, like, that would be odd. I think it's only three fingers. Okay. Huh. <laughs> that's really that's really interesting. You don't remember that from Seinfeld? That's when they were trying to decide on, like... Elaine moving into one of their apartments or selling an apartment or something. No, I, I genuinely don't. Oh, well. Like, I anyway, feel like it's I've a slipped into an alternate reality here. <laughs> uh, but back to ancient Egypt, you, we agree that it they either may or may not have, but if you go to China mm-hmm. uh, during the Ming Dynasty, they definitely played some sort of iteration of rock, paper, scissors. Yeah, it was called uh, Shushi Ling. And um, they... They it appears in print like it's it's like what I was saying the Egyptians didn't do the the seventeenth century Chinese in the Ming Dynasty did that they wrote history books and they said we've been playing this game called Shushi Ling a finger flashing game um, for at least 
uh, a thousand, fourteen hundred years, maybe maybe even longer than that. Um, and so that is definitively like the that what we kind of understand as rock paper scissors finds its root, if not in ancient Egypt, at the very least in ancient China. Right, and then of course that made its way to Japan, and they had a, a sort of a collection of hand throwing games uh, called Sen Sukumi Ken. Very nice. Which means Ken is fists, uh, San or San, is it San? Uh, yeah, San. Is three, or three ways, and Sukumi is deadlock. And Dave found a pretty fun translation of uh, San Sukumi Ken that is, uh, three are afraid of one another, which I think is kind of beautiful in its simplicity. I love it too. So it, it's, we, we have like a, a delineation where these things started in ancient China, made their way to Japan. Japan said, I really like these. Let's make a bunch of different games. Um, and one of them was called uh, Mushi Ken, which is pretty awesome. Um, and it demonstrates how it doesn't have to be rock, paper, or scissors or just one, two, or three fingers. Instead, um, in uh, Mushi Ken, your thumb is a frog, or you could throw a pinky finger or you could f- throw your index finger. The pinkies is poisonous centipede in China, uh, and in, um, it's a, a snake is your index finger. And by the time it made its way to Japan, um, the centipede had been translated um, apparently incorrectly into slug because Chinese and Japanese share the same characters, but often they have completely different meanings. So in Japan, it was a slug instead of a centipede. Right. And in that game, frog beats snake. Mm-hmm. Snake beats centipede or slug, and centipede beats frog. Right. Or slug beats frog. Yeah. Doesn't make as much sense. Snake would beat frog, I would think. I think snake would beat all of them. Unless that centipede sneaks up behind the snake, you know? Yeah, but that's the thing. I mean, it doesn't work unless you've got got one you can beat and one you can lose to, you know? (laughs) That's right. Uh, And then there was another version uh, called Kitsune Ken. Mm-hmm. And this was a two-handed game, and I guess it's just a little more complex. You did a supernatural fox, a village leader, or a hunter. Fox beats village leader, leader beats hunter, hunter beats fox. Yep. That's the, as the old saying goes. <laughs> That's right. But we know that it didn't It didn't start anywhere besides China and then move its way to Japan and then eventually make its way to America. We know that we got it here in America from Japan um, or possibly Chinese immigrants um, because as late as the 1920s, 1930s even, I believe, um, if you read uh, Western literature, Western reporting that mentioned this stuff, you'll find that the author feels compelled to explain what's going on and what the rules are with one of these uh, Sansukumi Ken games that they're describing, which clearly demonstrates that a Western audience wouldn't, wouldn't you couldn't just say the kids were playing rock, paper, scissors and leave it at that you would have to explain what they were doing and explain the rules because the the Americans hadn't come across this yet. Right. Uh, And in the late 1800s, Japan was literally playing a game that looked exactly like rock, paper, scissors called uh, John Ken Pawn. Yes, which they still play. I I quizzed Yumi about this, and um, I was like, did you ever play any Sansukumi Ken games? And she's like, no. I was like, what about Kitsune Ken? No. It's like, what about Jan Campon? She's like, Jan Campon, of course, of course, and just started playing with me. <laughs> so they definitely play it still. That's nice. Who won? She won. So mm-hmm. she 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 did it, and I, I thought this was interesting too. Remember how you were saying like you you when you throw, you throw on the third one? And I said, Well, some people throw on the shoot, yeah. like they go rock, paper, scissors, shoot. When she does it, she said that as a kid, she and her friends would say, Ja, ja, ja capon. And then would throw it on the po, but there was still four hits to the fist. You were hitting your the palm of your hand with your closed fist that you were going to throw the sign on, um, still hitting it four times, even though there's five syllables in there. I thought it was interesting. I, I've seen four more universally than I've seen three. Yeah, I think I think we did it on the third, and I definitely hit the other hand mm. when I did it. I wouldn't just throw it out in the I gotcha. air. Yeah. Almost like there's a uh, yeah, platform or a stage or something for it. <laughs> That's right, yeah. a little hand stage. Uh, should we take sure. a break? Our first break of the new year? <laughs> That's right. Will we come back? We'll see. Okay. 
Okay, Chuck. So um, we were talking about it finally ending up in uh, in the United States, and it seems like it probably came into the Pacific Northwest, um, possibly San Francisco, where there's long been a, uh, a strong Chinese and a strong Japanese immigrant community. And, of course, these are two of the countries that have been playing these finger-flashing games for centuries um, by the time they started arriving in the United States. Um, and it also ties in with a, a kind of a linguistic quizzical puzzle about why some people call it Rochambeau. They think those two things are tied to d- together, the arrival of rock, paper, scissors, and the beginning of when it was called Ro- Rochambeau, which is a kind of a regional word for that game. Yeah, I had heard that word. I've never known anyone that called it that, I thought, uh, and then until we did this research and I saw that it was sort of, you know, San Francisco is one of the pockets. And so I texted our, our pal Jesse Thorne, mm-hmm. Uh, Bullseye with Jesse Thorne and Judge John Hodgman and the Max Fun Network because he's the only native San Franciscan I know. And I'll just read it to you. I said, we're doing an episode on Rock, Paper, Scissors. Did you, do you call it Rochambeau? Yes. <laughs> are you passing this along to your children? He lives in Los Angeles now. Mm-hmm. So I know this pains him, but his children are technically Angelinos. Mm-hmm. Uh, are you passing this on to your children? Can I reference all this in the episode? Yes and yes. And then he went, Rochambeau. With exclamation points. So I think he they did it like Yumi does it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he says, none of this one, two, three shoot nonsense. Hmm. So um, I, I think they call it Rochambeau on South Park. That's where I've heard it predominantly, too. Oh, interesting. That's Colorado, right? Yeah, which is technically West. It's a Western state, I think. It's still yeah, influenced but it seems by— it to be really regionalized to Northern California. Yeah. I, but I've heard it outside of that. Like I haven't. Okay. I've spent a, you know a few nights in San Francisco, but not enough to pick up that the kids call it Rochambeau <laughs> there. So I'm almost <laughs> positive I've I've only heard it from like South Park or whatever. It sounded like you were writing a song there for a minute. <laughs> spent uh, a few nights in San Francisco. So yeah, have you ever heard that John Denver song, uh, "Saturday Night in Toledo, Ohio"? Jeez, I don't think so. Oh I love man, John it's hilariously mean. He said <laughs> you can go to the park and watch the grass die. Like, oh he gosh. just talks about all the just boring, stupid stuff you can do in Toledo. Well, sure, like if you go in boring. November. It's a, it's, no, no, don't, don't defend Toledo. It's, thank <laughs> you for the gesture, but it's true in a lot of ways. But it's a really oh. cute, funny song that's worth going and listening to. It's catchy, too. All right, I'll check it out. But anyway, like, linguists still today are like, why, you stupid kids, have were you calling it Rochambeau? And why didn't you explain to anybody why you were calling it Rochambeau? Because it's a linguistic mystery still to this day. Yeah, I mean, some people say it's from the the real life person from history. Uh, how do you pronounce that first name? Was it Comte? The Comte, the Count. Okay, De Rochambeau, mm-hmm. uh, the Frenchman who who fought alongside the Patriots in the Revolutionary War. And interestingly, that may hold a little bit of water because there was a book uh, called the Handbook for Recreational Leaders, where they literally spelled it as Rochambeau. Mm-hmm and not uh, how he spells his name. And that book was published in Oakland. Yeah. I don't know if, uh, what that means, though. Just because it was published there doesn't mean it was like a regional book. Or maybe it was. Yeah, I mean, I could see the author living there. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I don't know. But but I think it's a kind of kind of interesting that it is that, that Recreational Leaders book was published in Oakland at about the right time. I think it was a 1936 book. And it was about the time in the 1930s when they they think that school kids started picking this up in San Francisco. That makes sense. And you know what? Now that I look at the title of the book, Handbook of for Recreation Leaders, not Recreational, so <laughs> right, it, it was probably like a, a handbook for local rec centers, right? Instead, so, yeah, instead I of being like, back. "Are you a leader?" <laughs> Only recreationally. I don't take it seriously. Weird, uh, but they think it, it's actually. Um, well, some people think it's from the original Japanese name, right? Yeah, either uh, Jakepo. So you apparently just barely pronounce the N in the on the Jan and the Pon. So it's Jakepo. Okay. Um, and then in Chinese, it's Jingjangbo, Jingjunbo. Either way, there's that that um, hard bo or po sound uh-huh. on the end of it. And they think maybe American kids in San Francisco who were meeting these um, Chinese and Japanese school kid immigrants 
we just kind of turned it into something else that sounded vaguely familiar, which to me, that's what my money's on. Uh, I think the Brits and the Aussies call it paper, scissors, stone Mm -hmm. or paper, scissors, rock. Mm -hmm. And then weirdly, if you live in Manchester, Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, you're a Mancunian, which is kind of weird. Secondly, you don't clap except at the very end of a show. (laughs) Yeah. We performed live there. Mm -hmm. They were... Uh, They enjoyed it, but they were quiet about it. Right. Uh, And then uh, apparently they called this either Zip Pop Brick or Sis Pa Brick. Mm Mm-hmm. Just in Manchester. Yes. But they have all sorts of cool made-up words around that place. (laughs) Okay. So um, the the point is Rochambeau, it's still still and probably will forever be a mystery exactly where it came from. That's right. Should we talk about game theory? I don't see how we can get around it, Chuck. I really tried to figure out a way, but I don't think we can. <laughs> well, maybe you can embrace it as like this is the kind of game theory that like War Games was about. Sure. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, game theory. At, at its most basic level, uh, we're talking in this case about the Nash Equilibrium mm-hmm. or a Nash Equilibrium, and that's from John Nash of A Beautiful Mind fame. Mm-hmm. And – Sort of the simplest way to say it, Dave found a pretty good definition, which is a set of strategies, uh, one for each player, such that no player has an incentive to change their strategy, given what the other players are doing. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's a game where you reach an equilibrium because there's no strategy, essentially, that will get a better outcome. Right. Well, yeah, well put. And, like, equilibrium is a really important term because it's a kind of a, even though you're in an adversarial situation where you're competing against somebody, it also has a sort of, like, um, cooperativeness that naturally trickles up from that Mm gameplay. And there's not a pure Nash equilibrium in uh, Rock, Paper, Scissors. Um, In the Prisoner's Dilemma, which is a famous game theory um, kind of thought experiment, there's a pure Nash equilibrium where it's like this is this one choice is the thing to do. It's mm-hmm. not quite the case in rock, paper, scissors. Instead, what happens is is that if you eventually choose um, to – if your strategy is to choose uh, uh, doing each rock, paper, scissors one-third of the time, 100%, you can plan on over the course of hundreds of games to finally shake out – to winning 33% of the games. And that is the best you can hope for, so long as everybody else is is cooperating or acting rationally throughout the whole thing. But that's a mix that's called a mixed Nash equilibrium, and it doesn't really count. Um, and there's a lot of problems with applying or trying to apply a Nash equilibrium to rock, paper, scissors. Yeah, I mean, humans play it, uh, and when they play it, they do two out of three usually, or just one. Mm-hmm. So you're not doing it hundreds of times to let this play out. Mm -hmm. And also humans are humans. So we have instincts. We have psychological tendencies at play. uh, We have biases, unconscious and conscious biases, even with a silly game like this. Right. And that, that one thing like might be better, even though one really isn't like they all have an equal chance of equal, uh, equally losing or winning. Right. So the Nash equilibrium I mean, it applies. It's not like it just you just can't make sense of it in, in the terms of rock, paper, scissors. It's just as far as explaining a rock, paper, scissors strategy goes, it's not your best strategy. Because the best you could hope for is to win 33.33% of the time as long as you stuck to your guns and played that same st- – that's one, two, three every single time. Um, the the There's another strategy called a conditional response that they've studied um, that's, that actually produces a winning – um, like an overall winning score, ten percent more often than a Nash equilibrium will. Yeah, so this came from a study in China in 2014, where they did kind of the largest study <laughs> on rock paper scissors ever done, right. uh, where they got 360 students, divided them up. Uh, they each had to play, I think, 300 rounds a piece. <laughs> so you ended the up operative with. <laughs> A lot of rounds of rock, paper, scissors, and the pattern they discovered, the conditional response was, as humans, we instinctively, and it makes sense, we instinctively stick to something that wins, Mm -hmm. and we change it when it loses. So if you lose on paper, you're probably not going to go throw paper right again afterward. 
And if you win with rock, you're probably, or you're instinctively going to want to at least throw rock as the next one. And this played out in the experiment. Yeah. And so with that, they found that the conditional response, you can actually, if you if you use that strategy where <clears throat> if you if you win with one thing, throw it again the next time. If you lose with one, uh, go sw- switch to the next one. And apparently also people follow the pattern depending on how you say the name of the game. Like if you call the game rock, paper, scissors, if you right. switch in a conditional strategy, um, you will, if you lose with scissors, if you lose with rock, you'll go to scissors. If you lose with scissors, you'll go to paper. Like you'll follow the pattern of the name of the game too, which is pretty interesting. But all I that, think you flop that, but yeah. I, how rock paper scissors so you lose with rock go to paper oh I, yeah you're, you're right you're right but i think everyone gets it okay <laughs> so you don't want me to just start over and completely explain again no okay. i don't think we need to retake that so but all that combined kind of really points out how humans aren't rational actors and we don't pick things at random and we do kind of fall into patterns um and that that can be kind of uh, used to your advantage if you're, like, really paying attention to this kind of thing, depending on who you're playing with. Well, yeah. I mean, if you want to follow that model and give and technically give yourself a statistical advantage, you would know what they won or lost with, obviously, mm-hmm. and then what their instinct to follow would be, and then you would combat that then with the appropriate gesture. Right. But here's the thing. It's a fast game, and part of the reason this game works is because you don't sit there and go, all right, let's think about what we're going to do here, mm-hmm. and let's throw on f- five. Like, you just go quickly, so you got to be really, really fast to, I think, remember what they did or see what they did, remember what's next, and then combat it in that, in that second, I think. Right. Like, to consider your opponent's psychology in that fast of a, a time span, like gifted is the word I think you're looking for. I think so. Uh, or maybe professional. And should we take a break? Sure, let's take a break. All right, because people do this, maybe not for a living, but there are tournaments, and we'll talk about that right after this. All right, so I spilled the beans. There are not professional rock, paper, scissors players. Mm -hmm. Uh, but in the 2000s, especially the mid 2000s, there were tournaments sponsored by sponsors that had prize money at hand. Yeah, and actually, um, I think the prize money got up to like 50 grand one year at the peak of 2006 or 2007. <laughs> not bad. Yeah, it's not bad for playing rock paper scissors. And um, one thing that we should kind of preface this with when we're talking about the world of professional um, mm-hmm. rock paper scissors players is that. It is a really facetious, tongue-in-cheek, yeah. self-satirical world. And they make up a lot of stuff that is just absolutely not true. And it's really tough to figure out, like, mm-hmm. to, to separate, you know, truth from fiction when you're talking about it. And, in fact, um, one of the sources Dave sent was a blog post of a linguist who was posting about the um, the origin of, like, the Rock, Paper, Scissors World Society, I think, Right. Um, and how they actually were founded in 19th century London. And all of this was totally made up and didn't realize it until some of the commenters on her blog post was like, hey, this is this this world is not real. Like, they make up a lot of stuff. And she had to go back and revise the post. So if we accidentally say something that is not true and we say it credu- credulously, then, then apologies ahead of time. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of fun. They make up a lore. Mm-hmm. Uh, supposedly the first one was in a, a bar in Toronto and, uh, Toronto, excuse me, mm-hmm. in 2002. Uh, but whether or not that's lore, like once the media starts covering something and Bud Light starts sponsoring it, mm-hmm. then it, 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 it is a real thing. And that's exactly what happened. And, you know, they would make up fun names. Uh, uh, Sean Wicked Finger Sears was one of the players, mm-hmm. Unless that's completely made up. Uh, but it, it was all very tongue-in-cheek. <laughs> yeah. Um, another good example of the, it being tongue-in-cheek is uh, there's this great article from Alex Miyasi on Priceonomics where they were talking about um, how very frequently on, like, um, forums and, and um, just basically hangouts for rock, paper, scissors aficionados, 
They, they'll mention um, uh, the book The Trio of Hands by Wojciech Smaltsoa. Mm-hmm. And that it's basically like the Bible about rock, paper, scissors and, you know, wisdom about rock, paper, scissors. And I, I've seen that um, small soa is compared to Lao Tzu and um, that <laughs> that it, he, he was just this great rock, paper, scissors um, kind of uh, uh, champion, I guess. And Savant. this person is totally made up. The book is mm-hmm. made up. None <laughs> of it exists, but yet you'll find it everywhere. So it's almost like they wove this kind of alternate universe, hilarious alternate universe, um, to kind of make rock, paper, scissors more important than it, it possibly could have ever been. Yeah, and see, now I'm looking at these uh, pre-planned throws and wondering if this is all a joke, too. I don't think so, because they actually make sense and I I was watching one of the tournaments, and they were doing it like that. <laughs> okay. Well, the idea is that you can't just stroll in there as a, an 11-year-old girl and say, rock is obvious, so you always start with scissors. Um, that's, you know, that's playground-level stuff. So, apparently, the pros in the tournament will, sort of like an NFL team, will pre-script their first drive a lot of times. Mm-hmm on offense and just go with these plays. And then they start calling the the plays by gut or whatever. Uh, They have pre eight preset gambits uh, that they are going to play. And I guess they mix them up. I mean, obviously not everyone's playing the same order. Oh, I'm sorry. So I think these are real, but I'm not sure they're real. I thought you were talking (laughs) about the actual way that you're supposed to hold your hand. Oh, no, 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 no. We'll talk about that in a second. These gambits, I don't know. It makes sense. It makes sense. They got great names. Yeah, for sure. Should we uh, tick through these? Yeah. There's the avalanche, which is rock, rock, and rock, right? Of course. I love it. What about the bureaucrat? Uh, The bureaucrat is paper, paper, paper. (laughs) (laughs) That makes sense. Uh, We have scissor, 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 which is the toolbox. Yeah. Um, I like this one. Fistful of dollars. Paper, rock, paper. So it's like you got money sticking out of each side of your hand, your fist. Okay, I like the scissor sandwich, paper, scissors, paper. Yeah, and the point is, is like if you are playing and you 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 kind of do your your three uh, tries out of this because you know you play best two out of three, and then in a tournament that best two out of three um, is so it's game and then match. So it's best two out of mm-hmm. three games and then best two out of three match. Um, so I guess you could play a whole game with just one of those gambits, depending on as long as there's no draws. Right, but what you, what you were talking about earlier with the, the way they do it, uh, it is different, uh, and you mentioned it early, at the beginning of the episode. When you throw paper, you don't turn your wrist and go palm down. You just go straight out like you would rock or scissors mm-hmm. with your hand because if you were really, really, really fast and intuitive, you could technically probably see someone moving their wrist in such a way to give yourself a slight advantage on paper. Yeah, your biggest tell is if you're throwing paper and you are you're throwing your paper um, horizontal, so palm down. Mm-hmm. You are you watch you look at your elbow when you're doing that. It's off to the side. Now throw your now throw paper with your palm to the side, right, like vertically. Your elbow's still at your side, so you would be a chump to try to throw it. Um, palm down because your elbow's going out and they'd be able to see it every time. That's interesting. I, I, I can throw it with my elbow at my side. Really? Sure. I mean, I can, but it looks like I don't have use of my shoulder any longer. <laughs> I mean, I guess I could do it like that. And if I were playing for $50,000, I would do it like that. But it's much okay. easier to just play, <laughs> to just throw the paper sign vertically. And then the point of it all is all of it comes from that one rock fist. So you've got the rock, and then you stick out all four fingers. You've got the paper. You stick out just your index and birdie finger. You've got the scissors. But it's all generally the same thing. And the motion is just in your fingers rather than your whole hand and maybe your elbow. Right. Uh, And they programmed a robot to actually be so fast that it could see these micro moves. And this robot was... Uh, perfect. There's no way to beat this thing. If you watch a YouTube of just Google or uh, put in YouTube a robot, um, I almost said tic tac toe, <laughs> Rochambeau. <laughs> uh, and this thing has a high speed camera and it can see their little micro move. 
and it can it can change their thing so quickly. It's kind of a frustrating watch, actually, because right. they're doing it really fast, and the robot just wins every time, every no matter time. what the person does. Yeah, because it's cheating. It's watching that that movement and then throwing a the sign that's going to beat it. So there's actually human players, like you were saying, who who say, you know, people have tells. You can see what they're going to do, and um, again, that that all of it happens way too fast for my puny brain to keep up with, and and. Um, and and yeah. you know may throw a sign that's going to beat what i think they're about to do but there's been studies that suggest that actually we do pick up on what other people are going to throw and that a lot of times that probably explains draws that we're actually mimicking them there's something called automatic imitation and they think that it has to do with the fact that we have a, a complex of mirror neurons which we've talked about years and years and years ago Mm-hmm. Um, that that where 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 our motor cortex basically sees what somebody else is doing and makes us do the same thing, mirror neurons, and that that accounts for draws. And some uh, researchers in London actually blindfolded some study participants. Hopefully, it wasn't those same poor kids who had to play three hundred <laughs> rounds in the Chinese experiment, and now they're just kind of like. Um, pigeonholed into into um, yeah. rock, paper, scissors experiments. <laughs> Hopefully a whole new batch of people. But they blindfolded some of them. And the blindfolded ones, if both participants were blindfolded, they drew, they, they had a draw both through the same sign like 33% of the time. But if one of the participants wasn't blindfolded, the draws went up to like 36%, right? Well, what do you do for a living? I do rock, paper, scissors studies mainly. <laughs> right. I didn't want to. I kind of <laughs> fell into it. Pay's not great, but, you know, it's cool. They, they mentioned this on Stuff You Should Know. <laughs> uh, yeah, they – they uh, exactly what you would think happened happened. The Nash equilibrium sort of play out when they were all blindfolded. It was 33.3%. Mm-hmm. And then when it wasn't, it would, how much did it kick up? 3.3% to a draw? Yeah, which is statistically significant. Say that again. It is statistically <laughs> significant. Oh, goodness. It certainly is. So I think we got to finish on the side blotch lizards because this is just amazingly cool. Yeah. Uh, to me, this was like, what a way to end. It's kind of the perfect thing because there is in nature sort of an evolutionary game of rock, paper, scissors being played out in front of our human eyeballs. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the, what is it? The side blotch lizard. Mm-hmm. Because the three, uh, there are three varieties with uh, the color of their throat. The males have either an orange, a yellow, or a blue throat. And each of them have their own advantages and disadvantages, which we're going to go over. But ne- none of them have won out over time as far as evolution is concerned. So they switch, like the dominant species switches out. Is it yearly or just like every few years? It seems like over very long spans of time. Right. It plays out because there's not one advantage uh, over the other. And I just think this is super awesome. Yeah, because just like in rock, paper, scissors, one can defeat the other, but is defeated by the third one and vice versa. So in this in this kind of evolutionary game of rock, paper, scissors that these, these lizards are locked into, orange-throated ones are dominant over blue-throated males. But yellow-throated males are dominant over orange-throated males, and blue-throated males are dominant over yellow. So each one has a foil and one that it can conquer, which is not so amazing. But with orange males, they're super dominant. Um, They're super aggressive. They defend their territory to the death. And so they command um, large territories with lots of females that the orange-throated males um, uh, mate with, like, frequently, all the time. They can't stop. (laughs) Yeah, but they they but they, so you would think well then why wouldn't the orange throated males have have taken over and there only be orange throated males? My friend Chuck is going to explain that part. <laughs> Are these the yellows? Yeah, I think the yellows. Okay, uh, yeah, you got your yellow throated males. They are well. I think it's interesting. It's sort of like a, a picture of humans in a way. Mm-hmm. You have the orange throated. I think we should mention the blue throated. They have smaller territories, but only one female, right. and they all work together to get things done and to defend against attack. So these are two different, really different societies. And then you've got your yellow throats. Right. They don't have any territory 
They are mercenaries and rogues. They don't have any females to call their own. But their evolutionary trait was they evolved to be able to sneak into enemy territory and secretly mate with the females. Right. So for the yellow ones, if the orange ones are dominant, that's good for a yellow-throated male because there's plenty of territory and plenty of females to sneak in and mate with. And so over time, the yellow-throated males start to outnumber the orange-throated males because they've snuck in and mated with so many of the orange-throated males' mates. Pretty awesome, right? So the orange numbers shrink and the yellow numbers grow up. But the yellow tend to be um, shrunk, the numbers are shrunken by the blue because the blues cooperate with one another to defend other blue-throated males against yellows that sneak in. And so blues do best when I think there's, uh, when there's a, lot, a lot of yellows. Yellows are most successful when there's a lot of oranges because they can sneak in. And then orange does best when there's a lot of blues around because they're defending the orange's territory inadvertently from those sneaky yellow guys. That's right. And I think the perfect end of this is in, you know, 100,000 years, they'll go to study these and they will just see a wasteland of orange, blue, and yellow-throated males dead Mm -hmm. on the ground with all the female side blotch lizards standing there having figured out how to uh, reproduce without sex for males. (laughs) That's right. I think that's a grime song. It might be. (laughs) You got anything else? I got nothing else. Well, everybody, that was Rock, Paper, Scissors. And again, good pick, Chuck. Thank you. And thank you, Dave. If you want to know about uh, Rock, Paper, Scissors, go play some Rock, Paper, Scissors or uh, Jacques M. Poe or whatever you want to call it. Um, And in the meantime, I say it's time for listener mail. I'm going to call this uh, Funny Mispronunciation. So we got to cover this because... Uh, we got a lot of emails about that. Oh yeah, uh, cookie most ever. <laughs> uh, hello from Smithers, BC. <laughs> I'm a big fan, guys. Can't get enough random knowledge squeezed into my brain. Even bought myself your tri- your Trivial Pursuit game for Christmas. Very nice. Uh, which hopefully will be back on shelf soon. By the way, end of January, I think they're saying. Okay, great. Uh, I had a good laugh the other day listening to the Cookies episode. I think it was Josh had the most hilarious, unique pronunciation of. Uh, well, I think it's the Nanaimo cookie is correct, right? Yeah. It's cr- what did you say? Nanaimo. Oh, okay. Well, you, it's it got a Japanese flair to it. That makes sense. It was a it was a very naive way of putting it. <laughs> uh, side note, I don't think bars are cookies. They're bars, especially if they have different layers. I had to think for a second about what he was trying to say, even. <laughs> this bar oh is named after uh, the city on Vancouver Island. Duh. And is uh, pronounced Nanaimo. I Nanaimo guess you, City. <laughs> I guess you can put that in the list of funny Canadian names only Canadians know how to say, like Saskatchewan, uh, Mississauga, and Tuktoyaktuk. Very nice. I'm sure you nailed all three of those. Sure I did. That is from uh, Anna Ziegler. Or Ziegler. Thanks a lot, Anna. <laughs> if one of those two... Um, if you have a nice, gentle correction like Anna did, we love to hear those kind of things, and you can send it to us via email. Wrap it up, spank it on the bottom, and send it off to stuffpodcast at iheartradio.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.